as you know, we're here to talk about evaluating journal writing quality characteristics of good writing. Um, and we're here with Dr. Ung. I'm going to send it over to him as he asked me not to read his bio to save on time. So <laughs> go right ahead and take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Thanks. Uh, thank you to everybody who showed up today. And this is very exciting. And um, I, I, I um, first of all, there are some disclaimer. I have to tell you that I, whatever I'm trying to share, this is the first time over Zoom, trying to, to look at this topic together. And that's why I, I realized that one and a half hours wasn't enough. So I asked to extend it to two hours so that we can actually build into some workshop style kind of breakout room. I have a couple of exercises so that you can actually try it out to see what we, what we, what we learn together, see whether we can at least apply some of what we do so that this webinar will not be just listening to me talking about things, but rather hopefully that will be something that you could put together together with two or three people in a breakout room. That's why I've asked for the extended time. And I hope that you will hang in with me. I know that all of us are so COVID out are covid out and zoomed out in a lot of ways, and including myself, my, my, I, I have been making a lot of mistakes in terms of my scheduling and all this because of these issues that we've been uh, facing or been challenged with. And anyway, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share with you, uh, you should be able to, um, I'm not sure, can you check your chat part to see if, that, if you are able to see um, a, a PowerPoint that I have shared. If you are not able to do that, we will can do that for you. Or I'm going to share screen. What I'm going to do is that I will walk through the PowerPoint because the PowerPoint will tell you the structure. And after that, we will go right into analyzing an article that um, Carrie, you can actually post it onto the chatbot so that they will actually have access to the article. That the article is by Lawson et al. And we will run through them point by point, run uh, from the top to the, to, to the bottom. I, I have some notes, uh, uh, it's a PDF file. I made some notes, I highlighted some things that I will show you that there's only one way. This is my way of looking at things. It can be so many other ways that any one of us have developed for ourselves. But I'm just showing you when I look at the article, what, are we, what will be some things that I will look for. Okay. All right. So let me share with you my screen at this moment. Okay. All right. This is the title and the learning objectives. You have already uh, received that in our communication. So I'm not going to go over that. And there's some disclaimer uh, related to the scope of what we, what we do here because of our time. So we are only limiting our uh, experience today in looking at features in quantitative articles. I know a couple of you were talking about your experience and your, your love for qualitative. I have to admit, I am not a qualitatively trained um, researcher or counselor educator. So I always, but I do a little bit here and there, but I am not uh, an expert in that. So I will not even touch that. So I will leave some, maybe someday down the road, somebody else that we can invite to actually help us with analyzing the qualitative articles and the, the writing of it. And it's not, we will also not look at the research or methodological rigor or particular uh, design. So we are, we are not looking at that piece today because there are a lot of other stuff that uh, maybe other writing, other resources you can actually refer back to in, in analyzing some of the research reader in terms of a design, okay? So today we are not looking at that. We are purely looking at uh, what are some of the characteristics when we are looking at a quantitative piece, right? So, and, and also, when we talk about database, the quality, for me, qualitative research studies are also database articles. They are, and I do not want, and they, they are quantitative as well as qualitative. They are all both database articles as far as I'm concerned. I know that there are still a lot of people out there who actually do not like qualitative studies and they don't think qualitative studies are legitimate studies and I, 
strongly differ, differ. I strongly disagree with them. And I am very supportive of my colleagues who are in qualitative research. And we are also not looking at conceptual articles, meaning articles who are thought pieces, or maybe theory based, conceptual based. They are, there should be other characteristic or guidelines upon which we should use in analyzing the strength and weaknesses of a piece of uh, conceptual piece. So today we are not looking at that. But some of the principles probably should apply when we look at conceptual articles. And the other thing is the best way to learn how to write a quality article is to just write and get feedback and learn from other people's work. I always tell my students, I, I'm not that innovative, but I'm a very good copycat. So I will look at what, how other people write, and then I will, uh, and they, they actually spark a lot of light bulbs in me when I read how other people write and how other people present, and I'll learn from them. So that is always how I approach it. And the other thing, so we are also not focusing on grammatical skills or APA writing. So that is that deserves another maybe a series of 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 uh, studies that uh, a series of webinars or training for that kind of things. But they are very very important. Grammatical skills and also APA writing formats are very very important as well. Because sometimes journal editors will reject your article immediately if it's not APA compliant or if there are grammatical issues involved. Personally, English is not my first language. I'm, it has always been an issue for me in writing and in, in fine tuning my work. And I have to tell you that I have had uh, received feedback from reviewers. I don't know how they, they will even know if it's supposed to be blind that it was from somebody with a second language background. Uh, the, the, the idea was that, oh, this person should ask somebody to, to do like a grammar chat or whatever, something like that. But well, anyway, I was the only second language writer, but the, the team also has other first English language writers. So I just laughed at it. Because, um, it, it, but I, I'm here to always learn to improve my language, the way I write. The other thing, so for expectations that I expected, my expectation is that we have previously sent you some material that you would have uh, um, at least browse through the materials and, and watch one of the YouTube that I posted from somebody else who would talk about these issues that we're talking about today. That, my expectation is that you have come pre-read and pre-prepared in some ways so that we don't have to go over certain things and, and some things that when I share with you, you would already have some background in digesting it. All right, so, and the last thing is that these two hours will not turn you into a great writer. It will be many more, maybe two years, three years or five years. It took me about maybe five, six years before I did not have to consult um, writing mentor before I feel more comfortable with working on my own. All right, so that's my disclaimer. All right, so let's move to the next one. Now, how the structure for our learning experience. Let me know if I'm too quick. All right, just raise your hand and just type in the chat pod and then Carrie will help me, will relay if there, are, if there are any conversations that you need me to pay attention to. All right, so. The structure of the learning experience today is that we just go dive right into analyzing the Law Lawson et al. article that I, I, I believe probably by now it should be accessible to you on the chat part. You can, uh, and after that I will also share screen and then you can come along with me as we go through the article. So we will analyze that. And I'll hopefully within half an hour, we can go right through it. And after that, we'll break out into groups of three and I will have another article for you. All right, so that article, I have blanked out the title and then also the abstract, all right. And then the, there will be some instructions I'll give, I'll give to you. And after you've finished, I think my, now, I'm always very bad engaging time. I always underestimate. Like, I estimated to finish my write, 
my manuscript in three months, it always turned into a six month or eight month ordeal. All right, so that is always the bane of my existence. So even in teaching, my student can tell you that how I always jam pack things into a class that's always my, the problems that I always have to work on not to overload cognitively. All right, then after that, we will come back. Hopefully we will have at least like about half an hour for us to touch base on, to share our experience. And that article that based on which you will do your exercise are blanked out everything. And then I will show you what the actual authors have written as their, uh, they, they have uh, written as the title and also the abstract. So I want you to see not so much who is, which is better, but you want to see everybody might write differently and how to approach it differently. Okay, any questions about the format today? No? Okay, it's, am I, am I, uh, so I think I'm clear. Then we can move on to the next thing. Now, let's analyze Lawson article. Okay, so when, we, when I'm gonna go over that, I will turn off this PowerPoint, I will pull up the, uh, the Lawson article at last article, and it's 2020, it's kind of uh, uh, like current. And I looked at it, I was trying to look for an article that I thought might be good for us to look at. So we'll go through the, from the title to the conclusion, hopefully, and we will not go line by line, by line but some of the things we will skip. And then, and, uh, and we'll look at how do they present the story, because a writing is a, is a way to present a story. Even though quantitative is not a qualitative, we always associate storytelling to qualitative methods, but actually quantitative is a way to tell. It's a way of telling story, but from a quantitative perspective, right? And because quantitative has always been here for so long, so it becomes a major, uh, uh, it has a privilege. You have quantitative privilege, like quite privilege, right? The quantitative people are so loud because there's so many of so many around. We have so so much quantitative research. It becomes it, it sits. It has a place of privilege, but yet it has its own blind spot as well. All right. So anyway, we, there'll be another day. Now, we'll look at how they communicate the rationale or how well do they do that. And we also look at the composition, the organization, the flow, and some of the language, the, the linguistic choices that they use, that which I, which I happen to think that they, they did a fairly good job in, in, in uh, crafting the piece. All right, so far, that's how uh, we'll look at it now. All right, so let me stop sharing that and I will share something else instead. Okay, all right, so I uh, still haven't gotten this. I have two screens, so I have to go back and forth. All right, all right so are you able to see this? Raise your hand, your thumb, if you're able to, okay, that's good. All right, now, here the title, I have some notes here. You see that the title, is it concise? Is it succinct? All right, and is it specific enough? I'll, this will be some questions that we have to ask ourselves when we write when we compose our title. Now, is the, uh, the primary study variables or the categories of variables, are they clearly referenced in the articles when, when you talk? Because quantitative studies always involve variables, right? So uh, the participants, the targeted participants, are they, are they mentioned in the title, right? And some of the, the the um, guidelines or recommendation is to avoid yes and no kind of title like does this do this kind of thing. That kind of title is considered not as good. So usually I would tell my students or usually we would recommend do not title your, uh, your studies or your, your paper with a question. You should try to avoid that. Particularly if you have a question that, that lends itself to a yes or no kind of an answer. Right, and the title should provide enough info in, onto the research and try to be jargon free. I know some of us, we don't have to impress. 
the editors and the reviewers with exoteric works that only only few people know. All right, so be very simple, be very straightforward, right? Be very um, efficient, effective. So ask yourself this question. All right, like look at this: the influence of tr trauma symptoms on therapeutic alliance across treatment. I happen to think that it's very, it's good. It tells you, it focuses you. It's like a nutshell. It focuses you to what they are looking at. When you look at that, you know that they are they're looking at trauma symptoms, right? They're looking at therapeutic alliance. They also give you a clue that it's a cross treatment. So you would be and you would you would expect them to to look at a cross treatment at least time and time to kind of think down the road. So when I look at that. The, the title clue me in that quite likely this is going to be an experimental design. All right. So, and uh, uh, it will be the therapeutic working alliance will be a very, therapeutic working alliance will be a major focus on that. Are you, uh, so far, are you okay? Hello. Right. Yes, I'm sorry. I yeah. was in the uh, ABACA conference. Oh, so no problem. No problem. Oh. I had okay. a presentation. I'm so sorry. No worry. No worry. Uh, you can just come along. If right now we are looking at the article by Lawson et al. Uh huh. Yeah. Just open it up and, and just follow along our conversation. Sure. sure. Okay. Okay. And the next thing, the abstract. Okay. Look at that. The purpose, like, uh, I. Is is when you write the abstract, have uh, it has to be we have to convey or we have to at least refer to the purpose of the study, so that the the the, the abstract is within not only about a hundred words. Sometimes JCD will only give you like forty words, fifty words. JCD is very bad at that, but I think JCD might have already increased increased the word count for abstract for the abstracts. That's why I think recently when I look at JCD, the abstract tend to be longer than what it used to be. All right. So um, now different journals have a different expectation or guideline for writing abstract. You see that some journals, what you need to do or what they want you to do is uh, just purpose of the study, little like subtitle, and then the method, and then the, the findings and conclusion. They have that kind of structure. But most journals do not have that kind of structure. But yet, that would be the kind of structure that you need to tune yourself into or follow when you even write a little narrative of your abstract. Like, you look at this right here. What I highlighted here is that they, they, they mentioned the author examined the influence. It tells you the purpose. This is a purpose statement in that sense. So very upfront, you tell you what that is. Now uh, you look at that the therapeutic alliance at early, middle, and later and later treatment phases, right? At least it tell you that there must be at this part perhaps three points in the in the analysis, and then the participants were how many? Okay, who are the participants and the context? University training planning. So what what is the where this? Uh, participants were sampled. So you provide the participants brief introductions, like you have the age here, right? And the race also. But sometimes if it's like a lot of uh, racial mix, you don't have to tell, you don't have to provide all the, there, there won't be space, I would say, for you to, to give too much detail on that. All right, but it's important to have the context. So once people look at your abstract, they will know roughly the context of the experiment or of the whatever that might be. Okay, I think this one is more the, the they're looking at some of the um, uh, at archival data in some sense. And then the other thing is you look at that structural equation modeling. They actually tell you the method the analytic method, right? So I think I have some, like I have a note here method and then I hear the participants, the settings of the population. 
and then also some findings, right? You provide a brief note on some major results. Okay, so this captured the whole, the, the, uh, 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 an abstract that captured the essence of the studies. All right, so that would be what I love. Yes. I have a question. So, yeah. I mean, looking at the abstract, I feel mm -hmm. like it might have been better if in the first statement, if mm -hmm. they have used like examining the influence of this, this, this variable on this variable by using this research design. I think by adding just three words, I think it's very clear, like whether it's mm -hmm. uh, because experimental design have various, you know, sub designs. So yeah. experimental design is a big umbrella. So yeah. if you just clearly mention in the very first yeah. sentence, along with the purpose statement, and then yeah. by just adding by using this research design. So I think that gives more information yeah. by adding only three words. Yeah, um, yeah. Yes, As, see there's always way to improve it, right? Yeah. So when you write abstract, you always, you always have to bear in mind the purpose of the abstract, how much can you pack into it? And there's always word limit. Yeah. So it's always that way. And, and then within all those parameters, how do you maximize the space that you're given and give a punch in a sense? Like when, as a consumer, sometimes none of us have time to read everything. But we always drawn to the title and we're drawn to the abstract. If the abstract is appealing enough, it, it speaks to me in some way that I that create or pique my interest, I will spend more time in reading the article. Yes. Yeah. Right. So so that is very, very important. Thanks, Rakesh, for the uh, for that recommendation. Now as you look as you go down further, for me, the first couple of uh, paragraphs are very important as the intro, right? Because you need to lay the, lay the ground for the participants for your study. It's, it's like uh, uh, describing or uh, like, a, like, a, like a movie, right? The first scene, you always set the stage so that it's almost like to set the stage so that your characters get developed as you move along to your story or your movie, so that it become captivating and give you a central focus on what it is, right? So right up front, they talk about therapeutic alliance. You don't have time, you don't have space to talk about so many other things. So first of all, if, if the focus of the, uh, of the main variable is therapeutic alliance, you have to mention that up front, what that is about, right? And, the recommendation is that when you do citation, because there are so many things, you, so many people you can cite, but they say that uh, just cite three to substantiate if it's a major topic like that, so that you can always save space. The, the rule of the thumb for me, actually I need to, we, okay, I, I'm, I'm learning how to not even use the, the, the phrase rule of the thumb because it has a very bad connotation. Back to the, I was just reading something on feminist theory, so, so I have to be very careful about the rule of the thumb. For those of you who know, you know what I'm talking about, so I have to avoid that. The rule for uh, the recommended thing is that to, to have three citations if you want to uh, substantiate something. And always substantiate a certain claim or assertion that you write about something. Always, don't always claim or so and so or uh, say, for example, or social justice, for example, social justice is the, is one of the most major concern of counselors or something like that. Then you have to provide where the, the thought comes from in a sense. So always have that. And, uh, and then the next thing, therapeutic alliance, and then this, the next thing that the uh, child abuse or the experience of uh, uh, abuse trauma is introduced into the conversation. You see up front in your first sentence, uh, in your first paragraph, okay, in your first intro paragraph, 
clearly identify and describe the research focus of the topic, right? And the importance of the, of the issues. So this, usually for me, the intro of the intro of the study, I always, I probably would have spent maybe no less than 30 times in revising it. I will always come back each time because none of us, I don't think I've never come across anyone who would be able to finish one research article in one sitting, right? Mm -hmm. So we always come back, it's a recursive process. So each time when I look at my, uh, my manuscript and open it up, I mean, to a lot of people it's a waste of time, but to me it is what, how I do that is that I zone myself into the front end again, all the way reading through it so that it will come back to the last portion that I left and then continue from there. It's almost like I have to tune myself back into that zone. So usually, as a result, I will have to start from reading my introduction all the way down to where I left off that I was supposed to come to continue. So each time when I do that, I will, I will realize that there's certain things I didn't like. I would realize that things I don't like about the way I presented myself in the article. So there will be some revision involved. And for some people, the thing is a waste of time. But to me, I could only function that way. And some of you might not need to do that. Are you with me so far? Yep. Okay. And then um, you will see like what I would like for you to spend some time later is that for you to actually look at some of the some some of the comments that I make on um, on the PDF file and look at that. Because they, uh, uh, they give you some ideas and what to add and what not, things to add into what you write. Now, particularly like this one, like uh, you, you want to convey the most important aspect of the study variables, right? And then you also want to identify the gaps. Front end, we have to communicate not just our study, but the, the, the significance of a study or the, the uh, at least the research significance of our studies. Usually when we, from, from a writing perspective, I always tell students, think about this. At the end of the day, your research has to be able to answer the question, so what, right? It's, it's the probable question. So what? You do this, so what? Because people are going to ask you. Your interest alone it's nice to drive you to do the research, to do the writing, but the community, because you're trying to present it to the community, they are going to ask the question, okay, it's nice and well, good, but so what? So you always have to convince them that from a research perspective, that is a reason, that is a rationale to do what you're doing, right? So what are the gaps from a research perspective, right? Uh, are there gaps in terms of findings or nobody had done that? No. Just because nobody had done something does not alone justify that you should do it or it has value. So together you have to ask research gaps. How is it going to contribute to practice? That will be practice significance. Now for council education, we also always ask a question. Is that training significant? How is the research going to help inform training? Right? Are you with me so far? Yeah. So this is, this is upfront. You will probably have to paint the big picture up there. Like for example, at the end, but empirical evidence is lacking. So this is kind of standard way of communicating what is lacking in a particular topic or a particular field of study that form the justification or rationale for your studies. Any questions about that? Um, yeah. I'm just wondering, like, since, you know, towards the end of the 
introduction section, mm -hmm. we highlight the sort of in yeah. a few sentences, the rationale for having this study. Yeah. And then just adding maybe one or two sentence about like, therefore the purpose of the present study is this, this, this. Mm. I mean, I mean, I, I mean, yeah. it, it's very open-ended, but yeah. I, I mean, that's what I, I, I learned sometime like towards the end of the introduction section in, you just add it like, okay, mm. therefore this study is, you know, purpose of this study is this, this, and this. Yeah. I, I, I understand sometimes we do it toward the end of uh, yeah. literature also, yeah. like these are the gaps and therefore the purpose of the study is this. Yeah. And, and sometimes I have seen it happening in the method section also, like yeah. uh, purpose of the study is this, therefore this research design is adopted or, you know, you just talk a little bit in method section as mm -hmm. well. So I was just wondering. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, it's up to you, right? I usually do that myself. Okay. I usually would say that uh, based, as a result, we design a current study to try to meet this or trying to meet some of this because one study would not be able to meet all the gaps and all the needs. So it's up to you. It's also up to that when you, at the end, you have to look at the totality of your writing, whether is it necessary, does it really help you or not? So you have to look at how you present it. And these are preferences because you might not want to be too redundant about your purpose of your study. Because if you mention too many times, it's going to take away a few lines that you might not afford to have. Yes. Yeah. So oftentimes when we do our writing, everything is in there. And by the time we submit for um, publication, we will have to go back in and cut. Right. Yeah. And right now Gideon is working on that because I told him, no, this will, nobody will take that many pages from your, from your manuscript. Exactly. We have to go yeah. back and cut. Yeah. And that time is very painful because, but it's all my heart and sweat. Yes. But you have, you, you, they won't give you that many, that many pages for you to do that. So oftentimes you will see that you might have written quite a fair bit, but that to you is a good way but you have to go back in and, and sacrifice some of it because of the page limit. So my recommendation for us is that however you feel about it, go ahead and put all of them down. Okay. And then when you come back, when you need to trim, that is where you have to look at it from the editors and the reviewer perspective. Yes. Yeah. Certain things it's nice to have, but not necessary. So always think about if I can, if I take away a line here or a phrase there, if it does not take away the punch, the overall communication, leave it out. Yeah. Uh, Jeff has a question. Jeff, go ahead. I was excited to, to raise my hand. Yes. Um, there's a couple of things that I want to add to this that, that may, may not be agreed upon in the general, but there's, there's two components. So we've been focusing a lot on the technical details of, of, of writing a quantitative study. Th there's another layer to that in which you're, you're looking at, so they, they make a, a statement, therapeutic alliance, and they make assumption that we're all going to agree what therapeutic alliance means. And, and, and that's a real weakness to this paper, I would say, because, and, and I'm, I'm actually a pretty strong structural equation modeling uh, researcher. So I can already tell you they're going to have issues with their structural equation modeling. So just in the title and just in the abstract, I already know they're going to have some problems with their structural equation modeling. One, um, therapeutic alliance requires some, some cultural competence and there's no conversation around cultural competence. They have, uh, the, the, the only culture they, they mention, and they don't even elaborate, is, is Caucasian. And right there, that also tells me that they don't understand because Caucasian's a fairly, um, what's the word, let's see, a racist term. Um, 
And, and so right there, I'm already seeing some structural issues in terms of, and that's, and I'm also an expert in trauma. So I, as I'm analyzing this as an expert reading this abstract, I'm already telling you, I'm like, I'm not really that excited. I probably wouldn't read this thing. Okay. No, I'm just, I'm just, and I'm, and I'm not necessarily getting into the technical writing because Dr. Ung is doing a fabulous job of talking about the technical pieces, but I think there's a balance between the technical and the context and content. And so, you know, how culturally competent is this? How relevant is this across the gender reality? And then understanding the methodology. So as you understand structural equation modeling, you realize that if you try and, and predict groups across too many groups, you start running into some, some cutoff issues with the, the statistics. Yeah. So, uh that's why, that's why I, I, as I'm trying to say that we are not looking at the research rigor. We're just looking at how people present the ideas and we will always have, we, we will always have reasons to agree or disagree. And in that sense, in a way, it's good that they, because this studies, you look at the limitations when they talk about this because of the focus, because of the availability of the data they only focus on certain certain particular populations, right? So they will have to talk about the generalizability limitation towards the end and looking at that. And all research, no perfect research, there will always be questions that we need to pose, that we need to, we need to, uh, limitations that we need to question. So, um, thanks, Jeff, for bringing up those questions because those are very good questions and, and that will go into uh, informing how we design our studies. So whether uh, sometimes there's such, such a thing called the delimitation, that means upfront, the researchers themselves delimit or limit themselves within a certain parameters because there's so many things happening that can, they cannot address everything. So they will tell you upfront, this is what the little things that we're trying to look at. So it's like qualitative, the qualitative people, they're not trying to generalize it to the population, but they're just only trying to look at a phenomena, experience, shared phenomena, or uh, shared experiences with a certain group of people at that time. All right, so there are always limitation. And they are, uh, yeah. So I will just leave it at that, but I'm just trying to look at how each of us, now I know most of us, we, we, when we do our dissertation, our dissertation studies tend not to be very like, there are a lot of reasons why we do dissertation in a way we want to get it done quick. So as a result, we might have exposed ourselves to a lot of limitations, right? Particularly, now even experimental designs tend to get dragged a lot uh, for a long time because I just finished one with one student, but we got it published, but we dragged on like about a year because of the data collection difficulties. But even then the number was kind of small. So you always have a lot of uh, methodological issues to have to look at. And a lot of council education research tend to be correlational in nature and as a result, it gives us a lot of other uh, limitations. And, but correlation studies are still studies, notwithstanding its own limitations. All right, so, but we always have to acknowledge the limitations and where we're coming from. And what we hope that if the sampling situation is ideal, we hope things will be different, okay? But if you look at that, I want to come back to a little bit of the technical thing. Like, look at, like, let's talk about this, this study variables like dissociation and re-traumatization. So this gives you a signpost that immediately you have to talk about them. You don't have to spend time to talk about something else. But in the following, following uh, uh, paragraph, so they start talking about this titles and what they are. So in a research paper, you're not doing an exhaust. The goal is not to do an exhaustive literature review, but you are providing a targeted research literature review that 
is relevant to your variables or your business question. Now, for those of us who finish a traditional, who have completed a traditional dissertation, a five chapter dissertation, where normally your chapter two is a lengthy, exhaustive research, uh, literature review, you will find it difficult to give up not writing too much of it in, when you want to transfer into your manuscript. So that becomes a little bit difficult and challenging. Unless you can find a way to work with your, your chair or your committee or whoever that might be part of your writing team to turn your chapter two, your literature review into a conceptual piece. It's always possible and I've done that with some students. All right. So immediately you look at that here, this is the notes like literature review focusing on the predicted variables. So now you are, your first two paragraphs, you already built up the momentum. This is what you're looking at. And then you are going to convey to them, what do you mean by empirical evidence is lacking? You're gonna to have to discuss that. And this is where, uh, if you come along, uh, Jeff, that they, they, they provide some description and, and a definition of what dissociation and therapeutic alliance further down the road. Um, all right, now, so there are some things that I look at. Now, usually for your literature review, there's so many things. So many people have done work, right? And this is very good if somebody had already done some meta-analysis on a particular topic. So you just report what they have done. It's always good to cite them that way. Particularly, like for example, study like depression and anxiety that have been studied for like so many decades, right? There is, there's a wealth of information and there will be more than one meta-analytic study. You always report that as, as, a, um, as a, when you talk about your um, literature review. Do you know what I'm talking about? So in a way, you don't have to go back and re, uh, um, rewrite. Uh, the rewrite or reanalyze all, all the dec how many decades of work there. But somebody has already, an, uh, in a statistical way, tried to uh, group them together and analyze and give you those, the, the, you know, what method analysis would provide you. Or some people might have done a content analysis. Always good to look at them and provide uh, that kind of a summary of that. Are you with me so far? Yes. Yeah. And there are times I will, I will, I, you know, this, this is, let's, let's look at this one. Uh, now, this just, just put in a little bit about the first person. Like nowadays, APA say, yes, use first person pronoun. Because this is what you have done. We review the literature. Now, this is not the editorial we that APA talked about. Editorial we is something like, oh, we all should pay attention to this. That is like you're speaking on behalf of everybody, right? That is editorial we. But this one is different. They say we focus on the most prevalent. It means that they have selected what they wanted to do. So they are delimiting, this is a delimitation because of the dissociative symptoms include many things, but they're only focusing on two aspects of it. All right. And I, I look for things like this when I, when I look at, uh, so now I'm, I'm not shy in using we, and I will tell my students, hey, this is what you see, just say I, it's perfectly say, or I look at this, or I studied this. And some words like conversely and, my English is very, very, if you read some of my work, you recognize that my English is either about like grade nine and grade 10 level. I don't use, I, I do not know how to use bombastic words. So I try to use, but just clearly just lay, lay out whatever you want to say. But some exactly. of the things that I tend to use like today, only one study or today, no study, is always keep trying to tell that 
convey to now this is conveying uh, to your readers that you have done the re literature research that you have not found certain things or there's only one thing. So these are some of the, the, the words and, and linguistic choices that we use to convey to the way to, to describe your position. Oh, Excuse me, my I, question. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Fariba. Sorry, thank you. Right, yeah. My question is, uh, can I use uh, I or we instead of the researcher? Yeah. Okay. Uh, use I or use we when you're describing what you are, what you had done in the research. Even if in dissertation? Yes. Even in dissertation. Okay. Thank you. I mean, you have to check with your chair though. Your chair might be a very old school person. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> right. so, uh, uh, my, okay. Uh, so my question is, uh, I got some feedback from some of the professionals like, avoid using absolute language. So for example, yeah. this person is saying like only one study, only yeah. one study has done that. Now there are, I mean, I mean, I mean, I'd mean, say more than 10 databases in the whole world. Like you cannot guarantee as a researcher that I did every research, mm. each and every research in the whole field. Oh, I mean, yeah. yes, I tried my best, but I cannot use an absolute language like there is no mm. study no. or there is only one study. So I was like, use language like there are few studies. Mm. So the, the word few kind of indicate like, yes, there might be some, but few means very less rather than, um, yeah. You have to decide to the way to go around it. My recommendation for you to consider is that if you are, let's say if you at least use two databases to search or three databases to search, you right. can say based on our search of the literature using three databases up to December 2019, we were only able to find one study. That gives you the context. Right. Yes, yes. Yeah. So you are saying that within these three databases, there might be other studies that these three databases did not capture. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so that way you, you allow yourself to have the punch. Right. And you also uh, describe the limitations so that if people want to argue with you, then you say, you know, yes, I was limited by these three that I did until what time? Right. So, yeah, so that's a good point, Rakesh, to bring up. So I agree with you. So this, this one could be qualified further that way. Also, it, I, yeah, it's a good, 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 good conversation. I think I, if, everybody follow the conversation so far, what request say, right? Yeah. I'm also wondering about the first person language like I and we, do you think, are there like um, some journals who are like having this maybe bias towards having a, uh, like the researcher, the authors, rather than I and we, or is it like across the journals, across the field, there is like, we prefer this language? Um, I don't know. You will probably have to check in with the editors. Okay. Yeah. And, but if they say APA 7, like APA, even in the last two, probably back until APA 5th, they already started encouraging using the first person, right? Yes. So, but this is just, just a side note. This is what I, I, I remember reading is that there were articles that doc students, clearly it was doc students who did the literature review who said, so you somewhere, he said I, and then, but when you know that there are three authors in there or two authors in there, you know that, that the, the, the advisor just got tacked into the, into the the article and the editors didn't even realize that so the, i and when i look at that piece i laughed about it because i know that you know this one it, it wasn't people were not careful in, in in presenting the the way they write about some things you follow what i'm saying yep so when it says we that means two person at least 
And and if you say want to say I, you might say bracket the first author or something like that, or you have to you have to spe specify who when you say I. Some normally that might happen in 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 uh, book chapters when you talk about conceptual pieces. You would you would have two two voices. If you want to present two voices, the first author's voice, the second author's voice, or the third author's voice, you might want to clearly spell out who is the person. Okay. Now, uh, I feel like I'm running late behind, but this is some of the things that I'm looking at, right? And then you will see that they, the first, the second big block, they're looking at re-traumatization and doing a little review. And then at the end, like you will see, you will always have um, a, conclude, a concluding statement, a concluding uh, sentence, or uh, a short paragraph after your lit review on that variable. What is that? That provides you with the rationale, right? Now, always remember, APA doesn't want single sentence paragraph. All right, so always break it into at least minimum two sentences for a paragraph. All right, so I, I know we did, we're not supposed to talk about APA, but just to sprinkle, sprinkle it right here. All right, so here, I'm not going to go over for the, for the sake of time. You will see that the same kind of way that they lay out and, and, and then at the end leading to, uh, sorry if your eyes are rolling with me, like, like this is what Rakesh was saying. At the end of your uh, literature review, you would you would have to flow into your purpose of the study, right? So this is what I say. Has the then the, ask the question. Has the literature review efficiently laid out the rationale to justify the purpose statement? Do you have to have enough punch? You have to show the what are the gaps highlighted. What are the practice issue might be important issues? How have you laid that out that flow right into your purpose statement? That has to, in terms of flow, you have to do that. Otherwise, it becomes disjointed. It will be hard for the reviewer to follow or the readers to follow what you are saying. Okay. So usually in the purpose statement, you might this is where they rehash a little bit about the gap, like no research has examined blah, 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 blah. So therefore the purpose of a study, blah, 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 blah. right? And then uh, I have to roll back up for that. Then becomes, you have the purpose statement and then you generate your research question. Right, right here. And usually, I, I see more in psychology research that tend to have the hypothesis. But usually you don't, you, for most of the time um, in counseling, we tend to have the research question is already sufficient because we don't have enough space for too many hypotheses to be written out. Usually hypothesis like, takes like at least a quarter page kind of thing. So usually it's not necessary if you were to save space in that case. And sometimes certain research projects might not need to have a hypothesis, particularly if this is exploratory research, because there, there's no previous study. You're just trying to look at the first time how this research question pan out, because there's no direction, because you do not know which direction, whether it is a, a positive direction or negative direction for a hypothesis. So usually, now I learned about this. For me, when I learn quantitative, you always have to have a hypothesis, am I correct? Then I got, not reprinted, but I got scooped by some researchers to tell me, you know, some methodologists who tell me, no, not necessary, it depends. So not, so, so not every quantitative research has to have a hypothesis. There are reasons why you don't have hypothesis. So we are not going to have uh, time to talk more about that. So I would encourage you to actually consult, talk to some quantitative researchers 
of methodologies particularly to get a little bit more learning from them. So far, uh, any questions about this so far? Okay, now because of time, now this, as you go through it, there are some notes that I've made for you that how do you report, what kind of uh, uh, in, enough information about participants? How do you sprinkle that into it? Now there's always a discussion that if you don't provide enough context about the participants, it's going to be very difficult for readers or for other researchers to even replicate that. Because quantitative research is about uh, uh, providing enough context. If other people can replicate the same studies, that provides more uh, credence or support to that particular direction of uh, findings. Okay. And also, the recommendation is to provide some context of the ethics, some of the ethics, uh, ethical guidelines that you follow, like IRB, whatever that is. That as the certain things, it's always good to provide that. Right? So this is where they talk about it, about consent and all that. Uh, all right, so a little bit here, now, this is where, this is some uh, semantic or linguistic choice. You, you provide the number and then you provide the percentage. Why would that be necessary? Is it not enough to just report the percentage or just the number? What do you think is the, is the purpose of doing that when you, uh, they are like 73 out of like 81 counselors and then you put a percentage. Why would that be, be, be a, a good practice to do that? I never ask a question, right? Because I just follow the format. I, I think it, it gives a broader idea of like, like if there are, let's say two people and you just have one person, it becomes 50%, right? but it's like only two people and 50%. But when you have like, you know, 100 participants and you have, you have to have 50%, like then you have to like 50 participants in that case. So I think percentage and numbers gives a broader sense of the context that you are talking about. Uh, I don't know yeah. if I'm... I, I might be wrong, but to me as, as, a, as a storyteller in a sense that because there are some of us think in terms of number, some of us when you look at the percentage, you see the picture, right? You see over like 90%. Now, 73 is hard for me to convert 73 out of 81. Right. I, I'm not that great at math. I'm an Asian Chinese dude, but I'm not great at math. But I, I can picture what 90% means. Right, so I think it's a way of, of uh, it's a narrative, it's a way of picturing, it's a way of story, I think, for me. For some of us, think in terms of numbers, but some of us think in terms of picture. I might be wrong here, but as a, as, as a consumer, I appreciate that. So that, that might be just exoteric to me. So, but we don't have to, we don't have to find a reason, we don't have to find a specific rationale why, but I think this is a convention that normally you would be expected to do that. Okay. And uh, about instruments, when you, when you report instrument, you always provide some validity, uh, validity support, right? About the instruments that you use. Validity and also, like for example, in this case, confirmatory factor analysis, it provides what we call a factorial uh, validity. And then you also have the alphas. Normally, you provide the internal consistencies Reliable. of the alpha. Yeah. Uh, did somebody say something? I said reliability. Yeah, yeah, the reliability. Now, you look at this one, uh, 67. Normally, it's like you will, you will feel comfortable the convention is 0 0.7, 0 0.7, right? 70. But here, 67 is close enough. But uh, actually, I, I, I have a study right now with some students. The, the reliability is very weird, very low, like 0 0.4, 0 0.5. It's, that, that creates a lot of limitations. 
All right, so you have to discuss that down the road. Right? So usually you would provide this sort of information. Now there's also another recommendation that you will provide an example of, of, of an item. I suspect that they, this, in this study, they did not provide items example for each of the studies, that, uh, each of the instrument. But I think it's because of the space that they might have been recommended that no, we don't have space for that. It's not necessary. But some guidelines in the literature said it would be good to provide uh, some uh, an example for people to actually know this measure, an example of the item would be one. Uh, I'm yeah. wondering about, let's say if I'm using, if, if let's say there are more than one instruments to measure a particular variable, let's say counselor professional identity. Mm. And let's say there are three, uh, you know, instrument developed so far to measure this, this, this uh, uh, variable. Do I need to provide a rationale, like why I use this particular mm. measurement, this particular instrument? I understand sometimes it, because of the lack of space we have in, in, yeah. in, in like, uh, research journal articles versus mm -hmm. if I'm writing a dissertation, obviously there is no limitation and I can talk, you know, a yeah. lot about, yeah. you know, why I choose yeah. it. Yes. So. I think it's normally is a good thing to provide some rationale what, if, if there are like a variety of, mm -hmm. like for example, working alliance, there are more than one working alliance measure, right? Right. And, but, you could actually like briefly talk about which we selected this based on the, is the most commonly used or something like that. Or you selected this because this has got a higher real or greater evidence of reliability and validity. So there's always, or sometimes you might say this is open access compared to some other instruments that are not open access. Because poor researchers like me, we cannot pay, right? <laughs> we don't know, we cannot afford to pay. Like poor doc students, we cannot afford to pay, uh, except like Gideon, who can afford to pay. Sorry, like Gideon can laugh about it. Or unless you're funded, you can pay like $1,000 to access a particular thing. So sometimes we will not be able to do that. Right? And you might not have space to even need to talk about that. It depends. Okay, now I just want to grow uh, a little bit. Now I will leave some of the technical part like tables. There are some reasons why you use tables and how do you lay out the tables. I'm not gonna spend time. We don't have the time to do that. Now, um, they are, I just want to scroll right down like research. When you report research, very directly talk about geo analysis don't discuss the research or uh, your results. I mean, leave the discussion of your results to the discussion point. Just straightforward. Let's say if you have two research questions, so you just report the result for uh, research question one were meant uh, like was designed to ask to test certain things, and the results is as follows. And then research question two, just just do that. And are you with me? And then sometimes what I notice is that students, this is mainly for my students, experience from my students, when they report the results, they start talking about the results. They start discussing the result. It's not necessary. Just leave it until to the, towards the end when you are able, when you need to talk about the discussion, right? And then usually discussions that you re rephrase again, because this has been quite a long thing. We start again, what remind your, your reader, what was the purpose of the studies? And then you do that. So Jeff might have a lot of bones to pick with this uh, uh, SDM. That is perfectly fine. We will need to have another research uh, webinar on SEM so that we can train ourselves to be very rigorous about that. I have a bone to pick whoever reviewed the document and accepted it. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. There's actually an error in it. Mm, where? Tell me. If you look at table four, mm. 
it, and you look at the, so yes. that's P, what is that? Yeah, page? table four, yeah, just right up. 30, 35? Yeah. Um, and you look at early phase, the RMSEA is 0.14. That's actually a violation of the cutoff score. Oh, this one. And on this one, and and mm. if you go up to the, and if you go up to page thirty four, they say for early phase, the direct effect dissociation, interpersonal problems, re-traumatization was a good fit. And then if mm. you look at the RMSEA, they say point zero zero, which is really the middle and later phase. Mm. So oh. they they oops. Okay. They might have uh, the the information. They might add, add a miss problem there. So what it probably needed to say was for the middle and later phases, mm. there was good good fit of the model. Yeah. But there's a significant yeah. conversation there, which means that this this model they have did not fit the early phase. So when you're developing that therapeutic yeah. alliance, it yeah. wasn't a good fit. Yeah, and they actually talk about the later phases. It it was more important that it showed up to be that way. That was my big bone, but other than that, I'll, I'll leave my comments to myself. Good cat. That's good. Hey, I'm glad to have a methodologist here. <laughs> All right. So, and now oftentimes, now you look at that language like this, right? Can you see? Results suggested. We cannot use like strong language or results proof. All right, or result, stay away from words like results confirmed or proof. We can only say it suggests or indicate or support your idea. So it becomes very tentative, right? Even that's why we are leaving the positivist language. We cannot say all oh, the results show that it has to be this way. No, it just indicate or it supports what we hypothesize. And then in your, in your discussion, you will talk about what it might mean, right? Now, this one, because of time, we are not, I will not be able to, 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 to have this time. But what I want to do is to go right into an exercise with us. What do you think? And I will leave the rest for you to read for yourself. Now, some notes, like comments that I made in the article, are uh, just my are uh, just my way of looking at things, and I want you to be able to wear the hat based on what you have, what you have been exposed to, what you have read about looking at a research article, and now uh, paying also attention to the uh, methods, the rigor, and then some of the analysis, and start cut and dice the article. You have to be brutal about it. And then you will learn to do it for yourself. Because the reader or the reviewer will cut and dice yours. Don't be offended. Let them do that. All right? I, I've been told many times that my, my method is not, is not stringent enough. Yes. My, this is, my goal is that I will write a piece that uh, grammatically, linguistically, organization it flows very well that I don't spin them around trying to look for what I'm trying to say. They can always tell me your method is not stringent enough. Okay, I accept that, all right? But I would not want to give them an opportunity to tell me that your grammar is bad, your formatting is bad, your flow is bad. We don't know what you're trying to describe. That is my job, right? Because my, I, already, I already designed, my research, if whatever flaws in my design that I didn't see, it was my bad. I have to be humble enough to swallow the pride. My pride. Are you with me? But it is my job as a storyteller to give them no reason to say that you, your piece is like crap. Because we don't know how, what you're saying. Are you with me? Uh, forgive me, but don't forgive me for using crude language. All right, so uh, you know, once again, I flop at timing. So I'm going to share with you, let's see how we go. I'm going to share with you this, this article. Okay, 
When you open this other, you realize that is, the top part is blanked out. And do you mind to give, to give yourself a little bit, like maybe 15 more minutes, 15 minutes to, to work? To, I know we might, if you need to leave by two sharp, I understand. All right, so I'm so glad that I'm not getting eval course evaluation from you. Excuse me, I do not have article. Oh. Uh, can you, okay. So Dr. Rang, there's no, yeah. if they're sharing a new article. Yeah, it's there is an, yeah, I do not have any article. Uh, no, no, this is new in the, in the chat part. Can you look at the chat part? It's called more, more head at all. I don't see chat. anything in the chat. Oh. I, yeah, yeah, it's in the, I got it in the chat. I already downloaded oh. it. No, I cannot see. Okay, let me try again. Okay, there is a file. No, no, I don't have it. Um, can everybody get that? Uh, I see I it twice. Get it. So maybe just make sure that the chat's going to everyone, Dr. Owen. Oh, oh, sorry. That's okay. Hey. Oh, you're sending it to me privately. That's why <laughs> I got it. <laughs> I yeah, so I got a tutoring session. That happened to ah. me earlier, too. Oh, I appreciate that private message. I feel <laughs> <laughs> I do not have yet. Okay, now it's to everybody. You should have it now. <laughs> okay, yes. Yes, I we have. got it. <laughs> Right. I am so glad that this is not a course evaluation. Uh, there's no evaluation to my presentation. Today. No, 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 no. I'll tell you what, Dr. Um, yeah. um, I, some of my best teaching has been when I show the people I'm teaching that I, I can mess up too, because then they feel like, oh, if you can mess up, I can do this. <laughs> well, uh, that's been my experience. If you, <laughs> you feel accept, if you'll accept it. Do I have to download it? Uh, you, you can open it. You don't have to. What, I, what I'm going to do is, um, my intention is to bring you into groups so that you can actually read a little bit of it. Yeah, because I purposely blank out the title and also the abstract. So my intent for the learning activity is that you can come together and read through it and find some information. And let me share with you my PowerPoint some instruction for that. And if you, uh, so the instruction is that you identify a minimum of three positive features about the writing, and also two features that you think need improvement, right? I don't know how far we can go along with that. And also look at the limitations what do you like about how they describe the limitations of the studies? And also, what else do you think you can include as a limitation to the study? Just like, remember just now when uh, 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 Dr. Wolfgang talked about some of the research issues? Yeah, this might be, there are issues in this study that have not been addressed which I, to me, but you can also look at it from that perspective. And the last portion of it is that compose a title for the article uh, and also compose an abstract. And after that, I will share with you the actual article and you see you compare and contrast your title and your abstract to what the authors have completed. Now, obviously we don't have the time for that, but um, okay, this is what I want to come back to you and I want to consult with you. How would you like us to proceed with the remainder of our time? Uh, we have only half an hour, so I was wondering about having a dialogue about the writing and, and you know, what you can share your experience, how to get like accepted to a, uh, mm -hmm. a you know, journal, uh, uh, we, I mean, uh, it's, it, I mean, that's my thinking again, like, you know, yeah. uh, like having uh, how I can make the most of this half an hour. Yes, this is really important and maybe I can do it and I can send it to you uh, later. Uh, okay. All the questions that you mentioned and I can write my, you know, response and send it to you and get some feedback on that. But yeah, I'm open to anything what other people, you know, think about it. 
So, can I ask that's a good a question? Yes. Yeah. First of all, I want to say thank you for uh, very, very clear information about the dissertation. Actually, uh, excuse me if I'm asking this question because I was late and you may answer this question, but uh, my issue uh, is I don't know how can I publish my papers. You know, since 2000, uh, 2017, actually, I had 22 presentations with this presentation that today I had at the ACA different branches conferences, mm -hmm. but I do not have any publication yet because uh, actually uh, this is my second PhD. I had PhD, I worked mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I know how can I research. I'm completely mm -hmm. aware of researching and writing, but mm -hmm. because uh, when I came, moved to this country, I do not, ha I didn't have any idea about how can I publish my papers okay. and I do not, I don't have any publication here. I want to publish my paper, but I don't know. Okay. Could you please help me, anyone, if you know? Thank you. Okay. Uh, oops. What happened? Um, June's? June, you're sharing your screen. Let me see if I can. Okay. It's a great uh, picture. <laughs> I'm sorry. I did not know I have the power of sharing. <laughs> okay. So, the power all right. So let, let me, for the interest of time, and, and, you know, let me tell you, I'm a Chinese man. I always feel guilty for not doing enough. All right. So this is what the shame-based culture, growing up in shame-based culture always do to you. But, but don't take care of me. I'm fine. I can still have my dinner afterward. But what I want to, you might want to share, you might want to pair up, if, if you're willing to pair up with, with the other people to work on the assignment offline, that would be good and I'll be willing to, to give you some feedback to, to have conversation with you. But I really would, I really want to encourage you to actually try it out and, and, and learn to begin, because I have to learn to open my eyes to look at features of a writing piece in order for me to learn, oh, okay, this is how the rule of the game is, so to speak. And I have learned that. And it took me, it took my first three years, three, three years of my assistant professor's life in order to learn with a lot of mentoring. Once I passed that, I began to actually have a hang of it. Then I became a little bit better. And the, each time when I write, each time I get better. So I'm still in the process. So I would want to encourage you to not let yourself off the hook so easily by after attending today's uh, discussion, but to actually commit to writing, right? And then I will come back and to, to sounds like we might have questions that might be more pertinent rather than to break down into groups to, do, to work on it. Am I hearing that? That, would that be okay, right? And then, and I know uh, Jeff has written a lot too that he could also share with uh, some response to some of the questions. So with that, I would like to go into a Q&A session with what Rakesh has asked and also with uh, Farida. And some of you might have questions. So is it okay for us to spend the rest of our time to to share our experiences, maybe some, some advice in some ways, or some ideas to think about how to publish, right? Okay. Now, let me, let me respond to, I think Rakesh, your question was how to write or how to write. I mean, it, it's like, I mean, I'm more, I mean, more uh, uh, towards like your experience because mm -hmm. I'm from India, I'm an international yeah. student. Yeah. English is not my first language. Yeah. So uh, I think my experience is like similar to your experience in terms of like yeah. coming to this country and being a you know a student and then yeah. uh, getting a lot of publications and you know you know being good at you know 
getting published. So, so let me share with you some of my experiences, right? That might, that might be something for you to think about. I, I was, I'm so glad I had mentors along the way. English was, it was not my first language, but when I started working after college, I, I work in the personnel, or in those days called personnel department, now it's HR. I had a HR manager who took me under her wing in helping me write. Because we have to write a lot of business letters, right? Responses. Yes. Yeah. I, I, like, we have to draft like advertisement, job advertisements, right? Yeah. And I would draft, she said, you go and draft this out and then show it to me. She and I, we have to go back and forth three, four times per one advertisement, right? So she, she, she provided a lot of coaching to me in helping me write succinctly, in helping me communicate in English. So I appreciate that. And when I was a doc student, I, um, I, in all fairness, my English is, is really not that bad by the time I was in graduate school, right? But I still had a lot to learn. So I was so glad for Jerry Trusty. If any one of you, you might have read his article, Jerry Trusty, and who's now, uh, reti who's now retired already. He invited me to be his research assistant. So he asked me, Kotman, I have a job for you. Do you want it? Of course I wanted it. And he taught me, he, he taught me how to do lit review. He asked me this question. I had to go to the library. In those days, there's not a lot of online journals. You have to go to the library, look, open the drawer, all those white cards, and go to the aisle and look for them, right? And then I would have to write the, I have to write the literature review. Then he asked me, is this what exactly what they say? Because we cannot plagiarize. We cannot say something that the author didn't say. For the first time, he was very strict with me in making sure that I, that the fidelity, making sure that I, I, uh, I knew how to do it in the right way, in the ethical way. He trained me. And after that, he didn't have to tell me that anymore. So I had a mentor who held my hand, who, who, who told me exactly what he wanted from me. Are you with me? So I was blessed in my life to have mentors who were willing to invest into, into my life, so to speak. So I learned. So you see some of my early articles was with, by the time I finished my PhD, I had four articles out there because of him, right? Not, had, not be, had not been him, it would not have happened that way. And then when I went into my assistantship, uh, assistant professorship, I still have to learn so much. And I have a couple of colleagues. English is the language, right? So I always like Dr. Fer, Susan, Fer, I, have, I ask Susan, can you take a look at this piece? Give me some feedback. So I always have that kind of uh, 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 men, um, informal mentors who will help me look at it. And then I have another guy, Bob Alizy. He was uh, um, a big person in special ed. And he was the, the senior researcher in the College of Education, part of his job is to mentor. So I would send him my article, I said, hey, Bob, I have a problem with page length. Tell me how I could cut this down. He was so gracious. He always turned it around over the weekend. I sent it back to him. So we did that few years for my first, as I mentioned earlier, first few years, I had that kind of mentoring from mm -hmm. these senior people. By the time it turned into my fourth year and fifth year, I, I was able to paddle on my own, right? To use the, the like kayaking language, right? Because I have learned things like that from him, which your, during your graduate, your PhD, you would not have learned a lot of these things because you were so focused on getting all your courses done, right? Brilliant. So that is something that I would encourage you is to get hooked, like get paired up with some senior writers that's why we organized the summer writing collaborative, which, because I knew that if we don't have these opportunities, most of us will be, will be struggling out there all by ourselves, in the bio, so to speak, to use the Louisiana language, right? There will be a lot of alligators, right? So it's hard. 
and 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 a lot of feedback from journal editors. I what there was one piece that it took me five years to get it finally published. Right, Fariba, it takes time. It takes time. And then I have articles, I have projects that I actually abandon because I know that it's not worth any more anything. I'll just let it go, right? Just swallow my pride and learn from it. So there are there are situations like this. So the other thing too, Fariba, is when we first first time when we write, don't have to don't have to aim so high that it has to be JCD or CES. Try state journal, just for the sake of experiencing it. Try some journals that are not that stringent. Just try it out. It's the experience, it's going through the motion of it. Right, and then um, ask people, like say Fariba, if you have presented on some topics for so many times, but you're still not able to, find, to, to develop a paper to submit, work with somebody, work with a consultant to, to give you some ideas how to put things together. Right. Nobody, my son, nope. yeah. because I, I wrote seven books yeah. in my language. Yeah. Uh, I am a, a writer. I yeah. can write, but you know, I I'm using some editor to make my yeah. language because English is my third language. But uh, I don't know about there. You know, I came from the country that yeah. when I gave my articles to, to someone, they yeah. may you know use that article in the name of them uh, themselves. Mm -hmm. okay, yes. So I don't know. Yeah. Uh, can yeah. I trust? I cannot. Yeah. you know it's how true. much information i can give them i don't know anything about yeah. this yeah. that is that is real there are a lot of alligators out there mm -hmm. who will just don't even spill your bone out they will just swallow you up whole right you know you're that insulting happens. the alligators right you're insulting <laughs> alligators yeah because because yeah. uh, alligators are more authentic than these leeches um, yeah, they, they are more ethical in the way. So I'm going to eat you up and show you that I'm eating you. But some of the alligators, like, like, I'm going to eat you. Yeah. They, they're, they're like, I'm your friend and then let me steal. Yeah. And you're, you're, you're absolutely right. In yeah. fact, I would, I would even caution you in terms of, of presenting the material because it can be stolen if you present and don't publish. You have to be very cautious about what you're presenting. And, and, and if you don't have a manuscript, if it's something really innovative, and you don't have a manuscript coming in the next, you know, six months, be cautious about that because someone will take your work, publish it before you, and yeah. they'll get it, but they took it from you. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So yeah. you have a very relevant thing. And, and so what you need to be able to do, sorry, Dr. Ong. Yeah, no, I, I understand. I, 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 yeah, I, I wish that we are, not, the counselor and community is different, but sometimes yeah. we are really not. Yeah. So, I don't know what to say to you. I wish that I could jump in and help you, but I cannot take on any more. I have to be honest about it. I have so many things, and I would I would imagine that hopefully the next round we can do the summer writing collaborative that you would join us, that you will find yourself a community that can sure. be supportive. Sure, thank you. And and if you're on SASNet, and I occasionally I find some people send out send out some feelers to want to, to have accountability partners. And there might be some among you who might want to work with uh, uh, Fariba, reach out. And at the end, all you can do is continue to reach out. Thank you. I, I would also say, I would also say, you know, you know, it's funny because the, the, the reason why I joined with, with Dr. Ong's writership is because we, we had a conversation. And I, I was talking with, it was a random conversation too. I, I just it was like, hey, how you doing? I was like, I just want to check on you. And we started talking. And all of a sudden he's like, Jeff, you sound like, you know, you might be really helpful to me. And he's like, I have this project. And he's like, are you interested? And I was like, yeah, shoot, shoot me the details. And, and, and let's see, and, and you know, it, it, we were checking each other's reciprocity. It's like, are, are you going to give? Am I going to give? And, and, and we knew of each other. We were getting to know each other. 
And it's like all of a sudden, it's like, let me give you a little piece. Let's see how you do that. Oh, you know, you handled that really well. Okay, now I have this manuscript. Maybe you have to work with me. You know what I mean? So you do little little steps and you do little pieces and you kind of check someone out. And you're like, let's do a project together. So like I would do a fresh project first instead of trusting someone with like your already written stuff in another language and get a feel for them. And it's like, how well did they treat you? How well did they manage that project? And so you get a real taste and flavor for who they actually are because there's nothing like getting into the writing and then someone flipping on you. And they usually show their true self about halfway in or at least at the end when, you know, you get really time crunched. People have a hard time hiding their, their, their id. And it's like all of a sudden you're like, okay, that's who you are. No, nah, no, nah, I'll go find someone else. Thanks for your time. Yeah. So, you know, do things like that. And so, but I don't want you to feel like you shouldn't work with somebody. You just got to kind of do little check-ins. You got to do little check-ins and not put yourself out there all the way in the beginning. And, and there's a lot of people that are really, really kind and really friendly and true. There's also these, these you know, sneaker fish that run around and do their thing. And it's like, uh, so I'm stealing that from salmon. So there's, there's actually salmon that don't go in the ocean. The little tiny ones, they stay in the, the river. When the big guys come, they sneak in and do their thing and they get away with it because they're in small numbers. So you have to understand is these bad people are in small numbers. You have to be able to determine who's safe. Thank you. So I, I think the biggest danger for all of you would be to say, oh, I have to do this on my own. I'll be honest. I think that is the, the most difficult and challenging way to do research, period. And, and research is discursive, so it's discussive. It, it, it's, it's, it's about conceptualizing. It's about thinking. It's about talking. And if we get stuck in our own heads, it's really difficult, really, really. Exactly. Thank you. Thanks for that voice. Thank you. Yeah, the other thing from the, I, I don't mind disclosing my experiences as a second language person, as an international person. I know when I, when I went into counseling, language is very important because it's communication, it's counseling, right? Mm -hmm. I, I always carry an accent. It's always, it's, uh, my accent is slightly less now, but, but yeah. now when I go back to Malaysia, the thing that I speak like Americans, I when I'm in America, it's like, oh, where are you from? So I'm nowhere, right? So I, I knew that when I was in my master's program, I knew that I have to improve the way I communicate, the way I speak. I have to enunciate. I still continue to learn to do that. I went for a six months training in language in speaking because my goal is that I don't want to let my spoken language in the way of me communicating with my clients, right? I cannot expect my clients to be understanding of my position, because I'm here to serve, right? So I have to learn that. And I have to buy grammar books to learn about grammar. I have to do that. And Google is one of my best grammar teacher. Sometimes when I write certain phrase, certain sentence, I know something is not so right. Because I always learn in my high school, my English teacher said, you just say it out loud, come on. The whole sentence, when it doesn't sound right, you know something that's not right about it. I always remember what she told me. And she always said, make your sentences short. I like to like, so that, and therefore, and hence, like continue, go round and round, like three, four sentences crammed yeah. together. Uh-uh, no. Okay, so these are the things that, for, for those of us who are second language learner, uh, uh, user, it's okay, we learn. Go take a course, go take a writing course, go take an English course to improve yourself. Just like we do that, right? And like we, I, we talk uh, stats courses to teach us the stat. There is a language, right? Statistics to me is a language. Mm -hmm. So these are the things that our group will continue to do. Like for example, for us to, to participate in the conversation side, it's a learning experience. Right. Also, the other thing is not only second language people have challenges in writing. My first, you know, like my English speaker, American students also have issues too, right? All of us have issues, period. Right. Some of us have more, some of us have less. So and we all need to commit ourselves. And I have doc students who tell me that you taught me my language. You taught me how to write English in a sense. Because 
for us, I have to learn the grammar. I, I like sometimes I don't speak very right because when you speak, things get jumbled up. But when I write, if I'm not careful, also I have things get jumbled up. So I will always have to add it to always have to review. And sometimes even in my email messages, if I don't read it again, I always hit send and then I know there are a lot of grammar mistakes in there. Because sometimes we just think in our head and we think that how it's translated into words, they are right, but they're not. So all this, that I would read, uh, Fariba, I would encourage you, if you could find somebody, like, I have to pay for lessons. Okay. So if, if, there, if, if there's a place, or if you find yourself in a place that there's certain challenges that you would have to overcome by paying somebody to help you with it, why not? Yes, I'm paying somebody to edit my work. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But you also want to make sure that you you have somebody you consult with that is oriented in the profession, because yeah. th there's a difference between just doing the technical writing, but there's another component of understanding yeah. how to present the concepts and and how to you know you you need someone that has a clinical orientation because yeah. we speak in a rhythm like so yeah. we have rhythms and there's there's ways in which we we hook concepts yeah. to theory to you know psychopathology or, or this and and it depends on whether your marriage and family whether your substance Correct. use in this because different ones of them don't actually use pathology they use systems language so you know you really it, it's hard when you're getting an editor that isn't familiar with your profession i agree with that because sometimes our doc students, our master students will go to the writing lab for feedback. When they come back, it's still not really good because the writing lab people, the experts in the language, but they're not expert in your field. It will make sense. It doesn't, sometimes it doesn't make sense mm -hmm. to them. There are certain way of presenting the, the ideas. Yeah. Even though linguistically they say, there's nothing wrong with this sentence. But they cannot tell you the meaning, whether it's, it's, it makes sense or not. Yes, thank you. Yeah. And, and sometimes they'll correct something that we're saying, but within our professional language, it makes sense. But in the English language, it doesn't. Yeah. Like um, my father-in-law is, is an editor, and, and like sometimes he, he tries to edit my stuff, and I'm like, I'm not changing that one. That one's staying the way it is. Yeah. And I'm like, I appreciate you telling me that it's not right, but it's staying. Everything else, I, 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 I'm like, I, I like what you help yeah. me with, but <laughs> that one's not being changed. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I, I hope and wish that you will quickly be able to find a community of people who who, who share who shares your 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 passion and who understand your situation that you you could be there to to help each other out. And one thing to uh, I want to highlight to you: if you are not a member of the International Student and Faculty Network in ACES, there is an international faculty and student network you might be able to reach out to some of them who might understand where you're coming from in terms of your dif difficulty that you experience. You can, you can join that. that uh, it, uh, just, just send me an email. I will, I will connect you with one of them if you're not part of that community. Sure, sure. Do I have your email here? I, I don't. Oh, yes, I have. Yes. Yes. <laughs> thank Sorry. you, thank you. <laughs> I'm tired yeah. since... Um, yeah, I, I'm also wondering how other people are experiencing today. Mine was wonderful. Thank I you. loved it. I mean, it's, it's just really nice to be like, I mean, having this community, like, you know, sharing your ideas and learning from others' experience. I think that is very enriching. Uh, I thought it was very informative and I liked both approaches. The, the first half where we looked at the details of the article and then the, just the open discussion about the, the topics in general. And in, in my PowerPoint at the end, I have citations. This is a book, right? This is a book. You can, they are, uh, it's, it's in the PowerPoint too. You can download the PowerPoint at the end. This is a book that I asked my doc student to read. They're actually good. If, if I could have a doc class, I would run a class on this. It actually had, uh, has uh, like assignments, for example, an assignment like 
uh, how to evaluate the ti a title. That's why some of what I did is, is actually go right across. A lot of guidelines, I wish I could send you the guideline because there's an appendix at the end, but I have no permission to do that, copyright. So you I might be able- it. Is yeah. it in Amazon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you might be, this is uh, seventh edition, you might be able to find the earlier edition that uh, cheap, cheap. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. This is under Francis and Taylor. I think they, they bought over the publisher. They have a series of similar article, uh, similar publication about statistics, about reading how to write and, and, and how to interpret and things like that. I always use uh, uh, things like this. Uh, yeah, I have a series of them. Because as professor, I can request free copies. So, but yeah, at this point, I would encourage you to look at some of the, um, the older versions the editions that are cheaper. Is, does, do they cover qualitative as well as quantitative? Yeah. This one, they have the sprinkle through, like if this is the qualitative, uh, quantitative, but qualitative, you might want to look at it something else. The latest version, they actually uh, integrate the qualitative into it. Yeah. I would encourage you to, because sometimes it's very lonely to work through this, this kind of thing very dry, right? And if you have a couple of other people who are so nerdy, like, like me or like all of us who are interested in research, you come together and then you challenge each other. The journey becomes easier that way. Sure. Yeah. So I would encourage you to reach out among your own doc student community or even on SASNAT to say, hey, I want to study, a, a, I want to form a book club kind of thing. <laughs> like, work through this in the next three months of our life chapter by chapter, I believe in social construction because we, we only have one pair of eyes looking at the one thing is very limited. If we have additional pair of eyes and ears to challenge each other, the experience will be a lot more enriching. Uh, any other questions that, that we could, we have about five more minutes that we can actually respond to some of questions that you, that might need. Dr. Ong, could you share your PowerPoint in the chat? Uh, yes, I did. Did you? Okay. Oh, did I send to the prior again? Oh my goodness. I think goodness. you might have sent it privately, yes. I know. I, I don't mean to be, uh, to practice favoritism, but uh, <laughs> uh, I have just resent it. Yeah. Uh, everybody got that? Mm -mm. No. Uh, yeah. Uh, who are you sending it to? I sent to everybody now. I have resent it again. Try that. I still aren't getting it. Question. Uh, let's try that. Oh gosh, we can do. You should be able to get it now. But I sent it to everybody. Like, no, mm -mm. no, it's not coming. Do you want to send it out with the uh, with the feedback email? Yeah, we can send it out. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's not attaching it ever. Eh? So I I don't know why. Really? Okay. Let me close that out and then I try that again. Oh, that is frustrating. Come on, Zoom. We pay you big bucks. Show up. <laughs> oh, talking about that, Zoom is almost $500 per share. There we go. There it showed up. Thank you. Ah, is it really? You know what? Because, yeah, $500. Really. Oh, okay. I bought a little bit when it was like $67. <laughs> I do have a question uh, yes. that I want to present uh, to you. Yes. Can you quickly um, mm. share what is the difference uh, between um, that you that what is the difference that you you can say related to a book chapter and a journal article for publishing? Mm -hmm. I know you cover journal articles, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, just quickly, what are like some key differences when you're publishing a book chapter? Mm -hmm. Normally, Citations. Yeah, cite, yeah. You cite much less in a book than you do in a journal. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the book chapter tend to be less, less picky in that sense. Okay. And, and, and most of the time, book chapters tend to be more conceptual based, unless if it's a research based book, right? They tend to, and, and this is what I heard when I started my, journey, my, my, my teaching journey that. 
Your first, if you're on a tenor track, don't worry about book chapters yet. Get database because that is a bias. Database, article, journal, peer review, get more knowledge for you in terms of uh, your promotion. It's still true, I think, until today. And after your promotion to associate, then you entertain book chapters. Because then you can say book chapters mean other people recognize, they have recognized your expertise. That's why they invited you to write book chapters. Yeah. Right? The audience are slightly different. The audience is they're different. So, uh, so from that perspective, book chapters, sometimes they're research-based. You still have to be like the journal articles. But oftentimes, it's more conceptual-based. They are, they, are, they are different in that sense. And book chapters, sometimes they might be able to give you a bit more uh, page length. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, we have about two minutes left. Any other questions or feedback? Yeah, and, and I, I, I can hang, hang around if, if some other people want to hang around for some other conversation. I, I'm, I'm fine with that too. I have a question, but it's not, I think, in the beginning of the presentation, you said yeah. that. So there are two kinds of articles. I mean, like one is a theoretical article, one is an experimental article, research article. So as far as the research articles are concerned, I'm pretty much clear about, I, about the structure because we read it and today we also discussed about it. Yeah. But let's say in quantitative research, if I have to organize a conceptual article, this is where I struggle with. Yeah. Uh, Sometimes I go to the journal website, try to find some articles which have like these mm -hmm. conceptual pieces. But uh, I would like to know your experience or if you can just inform us about like how to organize a conceptual article. Uh, Let's say conceptual article. I always start with this. I always want to know exactly why this conceptual piece is needed. Okay. It always have to be bringing in some new ideas. Okay. To tweaking. Like for example, um, I, I worked on a conceptual piece with one of my doc students who is now a professor now. It's, that was his chapter two. It's on using Brandon Brennan. As a, as a conceptualization tool framework for training environment in counseling. Okay. So the article was that the training environment in counseling, nobody has actually conceptualized using a theoretical framework to conceptualize it, right? So in that sense. So then we will have to do literature research to show that, no, People talk about training environment, training environment, training environment is very important. But specifically, specifically, what are the elements? How do we use theory to conceptualize what a training environment is? But in higher education, in education, people have talked about that. But in the counseling and training environment, because it's, it's, it's kind of different, right? In some ways, similar to teacher training, but in a lot of ways, they're different. So we will pitch that, okay, now we want to emphasize or we want to uh, promote the idea that using multi-systemic framework to conceptualize the counseling and training environment. Okay. So there's, there's always a need to try to extend a particular idea or theory application. Run from Brennan's idea has been around for many, many years. But a lot of people are using it in different things, different different settings, but I'm trying to put it into this. But Jeff, go ahead. Okay. I, I'm trying I'm trying to I'm, I'm trying to edit myself, but I, I do need to say this. So the, the, the important piece <laughs> the important piece when, when speaking about Bronfenbrenner is to realize that Bronfenbrenner was a developmental psychology conversation. And if you're gonna talk about it within counseling, I, I would recommend going to Cook. I would recommend going because um, I can't remember his name. It was it was uh, Cook and Ellen Ellen Cook wrote ecological counseling, and then she wrote another one. And and the difference is is that from the counseling perspective, we don't look at it as a developmental model. We look at it as a way of understanding people plus their environment, and it becomes a way of of, of fully understanding people's experiences and and the meanings of that experience. And so again, that's part of writing and publishing is that you're, you're framing the concepts and the constructs within um, the core values of counseling. 
And so we really want to make sure it's humanistic. We want to make sure that we're talking developmental, strength-based, and, 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 and really, you know, taking that piece into consideration. So, uh, yeah, I don't know if that was brief enough, but there, there I go. Because uh, the counseling has always been developmental perspective. We have always been in the way we train is always developmental. Because you start with clinical skills, level one, and then you go out and then you try practicum and your internship. It's, it's, like, it's inherent in the way we train in that sense. So it fits into that model of people go through time and go through experiences with a lot of input from the environment before they come to a certain particular pos position. And I think that recently, I remember maybe within the last two years, somebody had written out a, a, a paper about uh, using Bronfman Brennan's ideas and, and uh, uh, using the, the hierarchical linear modeling to, to, to study uh, within the counseling settings. So uh, thank you very thank much. You. And if, if you need to leave, I understand. I thank you so much for being patient with me and giving, give, give, blessing me with such an opportunity for us to, to have this crazy ride today. And I, I hope that you will reach out to Jeff. Thank Jeff. And Jeff is in a North, Car North Carolina a and Yeah, and he, he does wonderful work from the ecological perspective. And his specialty is we early childbirth. Uh, children uh, like zero to three or something like that zero to five uh, zero to five yeah and he there's is my one, if you yeah. there's my contact information yeah. so there's my email yeah and he's one of our uh writing mentors in our w uh ws uh, swc and hopefully subsequent swc i will not him go i will but him. jeff <laughs> but jeff look at that the jeff i've look become i've become yeah yeah that's hilarious and you know what i'm looking at the rest of you that someday you will be a mentor to somebody else you know how important that is to have mentors and it doesn't mean that if you don't have good mentors that you will not become a good mentor for somebody else remember gandhi be the change you want to see yeah. Mm. Yeah. so that, that's that's what i want to leave here. and and hang around if you have other questions and then we can we, we can stop the recording at this point Oh, before that, Carrie, need to close. Well, I just wanted to say thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, we posted, several of us posted the CRLL YouTube video <laughs> that has archived a lot of these different conversations, so you might find some of them helpful. We will be emailing out a survey, so please take a couple minutes to fill that out because it's really helpful for us to develop these programs for you. Um, yes, and please stay connected. It was really great to have you all this afternoon. Mm -hmm. Thank you.